I've always steered away from using visual effects whenever possible. I think that there are certain things you can't achieve otherwise, but in the past I've always been reticent to use visual effects to the extent that other filmmakers might. That being said, in the last few years there have been a lot of wonderful visual effects movies where I, it, it, it's beginning to become seamless even to me, and I'm a person who understands the way that they work, and I oversee them. Certainly in doing a movie like Iron Man, there's no way to do this film without them. And so the balance that you, you try to strike as a director, I think, is to mix up the visual effects with practical effects in a way where you start to forget where one begins and the other ends. Okay. We looked at all the vendors that we could have doing uh, uh, the special effects on this, and uh, we isolated different companies all over the world that we thought would be good. We looked at them for specific tasks that we thought they might be the best at. And uh, within that, we got a, uh, looked at a bunch of tests that they did. Right now we have three companies doing the visual effects for uh, Iron Man. We have Industrial Light and Magic in San Francisco doing um, the lion's share of the work. It's the hardest work, I think. The Orphanage, also in San Francisco, which are XILM people and now have a smaller company. And they're doing some of the smaller stuff. And then we have a very small house in Vancouver, Canada called the Embassy, is doing uh, the Mark I sequences, which is the, uh, um, the most, uh, the crudest suit the one he makes out of spare parts. Doing Iron Man, it's, uh, it's something that's been a lot longer process. It's more like a marathon than a race, but it's, it's been something that everyone's been really, really into doing. We started with the scan that we were given, and um, the scan didn't include all of the pieces, so we had to go in, add pieces that weren't included in the scan, and adjust things that maybe weren't entirely accurate, so there was a lot of remodeling that had to be done to get it to the final state. And then we had to also do what we call unwrapping, which is you give this look, you basically flatten out all the pieces so you can then texture it with photos or hand-painted textures. We were also given a lot of high-res images of Robert Downey because there's a few shots where he approaches camera. The suit comes right by camera. And so using those images, again, we have to like flatten it out to get facial textures going. The first Mark suit has all the different signatures of all the parts that are on it. So, you know, you'll see a little bit of paint from one, you know, uh, an insignia of Stark Industries from another. Little details like spinning fans in the back and things like that were added to. We did also rig up these pieces. These have the drive belts that kind of control his legs. So every time you move the leg up, everything rotates to correspond. Well, it's, it's pretty damn close to the actual practical guy. I think we can cut back and forth. And it's, it's pretty seamless, I think. Here is a mocap sequence that we got that they shot down in LA at Giant. Um, and we got the mocap and we transferred it onto a, the rig of our 3D model. It's somewhat imperfect when it first comes in. This is the mocap of one of the sequences where he's walking down a hill with his flamethrower going. Once we get that and we map it onto our rig, it looks a little bit like that. So there's all kinds of problems with the shoulders and with his head. And once we clean that up, we end up with something looking a little bit more like this. based on a still shot. So we have a still plate 
that was actually scanned at eFilm at 4K so that we can move in on the plate and actually do a camera move down through it that's added in the post. But anyway, we take all those layers, which are the CG Iron Man. Uh, there's computer-generated smoke that goes in front of him as well to blend him back into the background. The CG reflection pass and then color correct him. Even have little Robert Downey's eyes in there and he's blinking up and down. Actually, he's a little bit, uh, he has a little blinking and he follows motion. So we move a null somewhere where we think the, in the insurgent should be and his eyes will track and follow them in that area where we think it should be looking. So this is one thing we did where, uh, for one thing, the, the guy in the suit could not stand up like this or bend in that position. Even when we, we motion captured the actor, there's still some issues where you would see pass through. His hand may move and his forearm may intersect with his bicep or his hip may intersect with something else. Like right in here, you can see this has to be really close where it's actually moving and not intersecting with his hip to make it look real. And then once that, once the CG is done, it comes down here and the compositors put everything else together and make it, make it look real. And this is a really interesting shot here because actually the director, John Favreau, is actually the motion capture, motion capture, motion capture actor in this particular scene. And uh, the original shot was done with, a, um, with the practical guy in the suit. Uh, there was a little bit of a stumble and a bit of a weird move at the end after he did the punch. And the production really wasn't all that happy with it. We're working on this shot right now. So you'll see that this is a much less final looking shot. And Iron Man is really rough looking. It's a low res render. But you can actually see John's motion capture in there. And he's, he's done a really good punch on the guy. Sent him flying. And uh, it's just a much more heroic stance, which is cool. And uh, it's good that John got, John got to get in that suit and uh, he can tell his friends for years to come how he got into Iron Man's suit. Everyone in our industry wants to make shiny metal robots, you know? So, uh, so having a big metal robot guy running around blowing things up is kind of your dream job. I remember talking to John Nelson way back and we were talking about, well, what are we going to do with Iron Man because we've got Robert Downey Jr., who's an amazing character actor and is all about the face and the eyes, but we're sticking him in this metal suit where nobody's going to be able to see him. How are we going to solve that problem? Gage heads up display. Check. Afford all preferences from home interface. We'll do so. 19 months ago, I walked into visual effects supervisor John Nelson's office and on his wall, he had a picture from 2001, A Space Odyssey of Dave in his helmet with all the reflections on his face in the slit scan se sequence. And I said, well, what are you, what's that doing on the wall? And he said, well, come with me. And we walked over to the storyboard artist, and they had drawn these shots of Tony inside his mask. But they weren't inside his mask because there was this depth to it with graphics in front of his face. And I said, that's going to be the coolest thing in this movie. The HUD was, in many ways, kind of the dream job that we always are sort of dying to get at the orphanage. I mean, um, you know, we're a visual effects house, and oftentimes we are asked to do visual effects where it's like, make this jet look exactly like a jet, or make this explosion look exactly like you know exactly what it looks like. And the HUD was one of these things where, make something that you've never seen before, that nobody's ever seen before, but yet something that everybody thinks is really cool. Like a dream. We have many of these shots where you actually see Tony flying and you see him doing his thing, but then we actually see it through Tony's eyes looking out. And that's a big challenge, to make all of that work in a, in a way that keeps it all within, all the spectacle within a believable sphere. As a graphic designer, you're constantly striving to make what we consider a, a good design. And good design always starts with, what's our playing field? What are we trying to do here? What are our constraints? Every single widget that's in these shots, every single thing that's, ex that's, that's there has been thought about. The audience may not pick up on what that is, they just know they can relate to it because it's intuitive. And that's a word that came up over and over again in this HUD design process is, is it intuitive? Every widget was supposedly a collapsed complex mechanism. But once it was activated, it would explode open in Z-axis space. So information is simple at first, but then becomes more complicated and revealed as you need it. The other notion was that it's sometimes Jarvis is bringing up information to him, and sometimes he's calling information from Jarvis. Sir, it appears that this suit can fly. Duly noted. Take me to maximum altitude. With only 15% power, the odds of reaching that... Altitude. I know the math. Do it. 
John Nelson came to me and said three things had to happen. One, it had to be performance driven. You had to always feel Robert, what he was doing, and you couldn't obscure his performance. You had to let it drive what happened. Two, you had to let the Z axis, you had to really feel the Z axis space in the HUD. So you wanted to feel the depth of when graphics came to him and, and how it was displayed. And three, you should always have what he called an alpha event or something that it was doing at that moment. So each shot has one thing, at least one thing that you could point to and say, this shot's about targeting. This shot's about horizon lock. So once we sort of figured that out, it drove the rest of the, of, of the process. Our approach on the design of all the HUDs together was that the Iron Monger HUD was the HUD that Stark Industries released to the military. So it's a bare bones, aggressive, fight battle HUD. And so we use sort of this vector style of graphics and John Favreau sort of referenced these kind of asteroids and those, those, that level of graphics. And so we use that as, as sort of the touchstone for the Monger HUD and it's aggressive and it's mean and it's, and it's a little bit primitive in sort of what you would expect the military to have. And then we went to Tony, we said, he would take that technology and make it his own. He would make it slick just like he is. He would really think about the UI design. You know, we had so many conversations about color. 80s was kind of like amber was high tech. And then in the 90s, it kind of went into blues and cyan. So we went with a cyan, which was not quite a blue and yet not quite a green. If you notice in the beginning of the HUD work, there are two modes. He's in sort of the beginning analysis mode, and then he switches into flight mode. And all the widgets sort of move around and they do this sort of conversion process. We said, we need to show progression because all of Tony's technology shows progression throughout the movie. So by the time he gets to the Mark III, it's just one HUD, whether he's on the ground or whether he's in the air. And that was a conscious choice to show the progression. So it was funny because Wesley Sewell, who was an additional supervisor for the production on the show, came to me when I was sort of doing my early look dev on the, on the HUDs. And he said, you know what would be cool? White HUD. And I looked at Wes and I said, that's a great idea. And we can use color to accent the white interface is the cleanest, the simplest, and in, in a way, it's like the least obvious and the most obvious at the same time. Because we thought simplify is going to make it really clean and simple. I think that that's what makes the Mark III successful, is that it is predominantly white, and that you have color, pops of color for attention. Boom, the power's low. Boom, right here we're targeting. All these things come up because of the color. The Mark II, there's kind of a new widget for everything. There's a radar widget, there's a, a speed widget, there's like a, um, there's a, a diagnostics widget, there's all these different things. Then we thought, there should be one, we call it the Omega widget, one widget that has this kind of like, sort of like an iPod, sort of like a DVD player, north, south, east, west, kind of a really basic design that we all know and understand with four quadrants. So in its rest state, we have navigation at the top, sort of health at the bottom, power on this side, and diagnostics on that side, and some targeting and some other information. But then, when he actually looks at it, there should be a lot more information available. So this whole bottom thing, which used to be just a, a single power level, then expands out, and we can see how it's, it's got all of these new calipers, and they all, from Tony's perspective, looking through it, it explodes out in Z away from him. So that's, that's the power side of it. Then the health side of it, at first there's a couple parameters for the health and then it explodes out and shows them the Iron Man and all that kind of thing. And then the navigation is the same way, extra controls kind of pop up. I see all the great work that those guys in the orphanage did to make the HUDs great. And the ha my hat's off really to Dov Rock and his crew of people up there at the orphanage. And Jonathan Rothbart, the overall supervisor, did a great job with these HUDs and I'm really happy with it. Jarvis, sometimes you gotta run before you can walk. Time to hit the button! It's funny, you go into a project like Iron Man and you say, okay, well, we've done robotic sort of things, we've done vehicles, you know, this should be okay. Cool power. This film has a real um, unique difference from, from robot films in that the characters are... Uh, you know, they're human beings inside these suits. They're more like knights in, in armor. In this film, the challenges were to 
sort of take a armor that he creates for himself and extend that in computer graphics in a way that you buy completely as being something that Robert Downey Jr. is wearing. Please try not to move. Hey. What's going on here? Let's face it, this is not the worst thing you've caught me doing. I went over and talked to some of our best hard surface model people, um, uh, Bruce Holcomb and Ron Woodall, and basically said, oh, look, I've got this project coming called Iron Man. We have to do a test. And they jumped out of their seats and hit the roof laughing. And it was like, yes. We had just sort of not maybe a month prior, not having heard anything about you know the project starting maybe a month prior I started seriously talking about trying to do something with it again and he and I both um, had made the backgrounds on our uh, machines Iron Man related you know images just to sort of daily inspire one another and he used to say we're never gonna get this thing done it's a big pipe dream <laughs> um, and then that's when Ben did come and kind of mentioned it and he basically said I told you I told you they were going to do it. Now they got it. And now you can't do it. You know, it's interesting. John Favreau's approach to filmmaking, which makes it really great to work with him, is it's almost Altman-esque, which is kind of an odd thing that you see. You, you don't normally run into that with visual effects. A really gratifying side of that is that you get to contribute ideas. And it's a collaboration, and he would challenge us. You know, John Favreau's approach to the creatures, the way they work, you know, he didn't want it to be kung fu-y. He wanted it to be more like, you know, bare-knuckle brawling. He definitely has, like, kind of the cool library in his head of, you know, cool, cool YouTube stuff. John Favreau is very much about um, uh, uh, invisible visual effects uh, supporting the story. And we talked a lot about stressing what the suit could do and not creating shots just to show off the visual effect there. We want to create a shot to tell the story and tell it well. Dine Man didn't feel like it was approached like a superhero movie. It felt like it was approached like something with more realism. We started off by referencing a lot of the comic book art, like the early artwork that uh, Jack Kirby had done and, and later on I think Steve Ditko um, had done in terms of um, in terms of the tech and things like that. So say, you know, his, his energy is, you know, rendered a certain way in the comic book, um, you know, his RT energy and his chest RT energy. Uh, but how does that translate onto a photorealistic environment, say on screen, where, you know, you have to believe that this energy is powerful enough to, you know, uh, shoot a car out of the way or shoot him through the sky like a, you know, like a fighter jet. Um, so that's when we started referencing a lot of real life, real world instances where uh, this technology, you know, what does this type of technology look like? actually put a lot of work into saying, okay, based on the design of the suit, how would he then use this to fly? You know, how would he make his flaps come out? What would he use to steer? That sort of thing. Tony's suit is so tricked out and fully featured and bits fold out of it and he's got weapons that pop up from it. And we actually build a whole underlayer to the suit to try and make it, um, you know, you could really see, oh, I can kind of get a sense of how this thing's driven and how it protects him and makes him strong. All of the undertech stuff that is underneath the suit kind of got developed as we went along through the movie. And there are many shots of Robert Downey Jr. with a lot of the under mech on his arms and then on, on the boots, which I think they made practically as well. <laughs> early on where he he's tested all his flying rig and he's been um, he's made you know got his what we call repulsor technology thrusters the things that actually propel him and he's trying he's made a suit a flying suit that he's testing and so we've got these big tracking shots that go around the silver suit as it starts 
folding pieces out and testing the flying surfaces. So there's these shots which we'd shot with the practical suit where the camera dollied around the practical suit. But we ended up, you know, replacing it in these shots because we really needed just everything to move. But we had, you know, it gave us really good reference and then we could, you know, just make it that bit sweeter. It's just so much fun to see all those pieces moving. And so that's a lot of, again, in terms of the design of the suit, um, you know, it was taken to a certain stage in the practical suit and then once we got into the computer world and we really wanted to move things and, and have bits move, then, you know, we sort of modified things so that we could get a lot more action out of it, a lot more interest. The goal was to kind of not make him so much of a transformer, uh, more as like his, his uh, armor is unified. And that's, I think we wanted to get away from the vacuum form look and more of like the, the parts were mechanized for a purpose. Interestingly, what happens for that shot is we do a match move on it where we try to get the position of the camera and uh, the position slightly of uh, the creature, the suit. Then our animator and creature dev person comes in and start moving all the PCs. And then we go in the long, long process of lighting these. So this is a tech where we have the real one and on the side, we have our CG one. You know, getting the metal look on both the Mark II where he's, he's unpainted and it's this kind of brushed metal look and the Mark III where it's the, the red and gold has been really tough. It was a struggle to get that brushed metal looking right on the Mark II, but we sort of realized that we, were, we, we basically got there. When, they, when John Favreau and John Nelson, the client side effects, suit, they started forgetting which bits were the real suit and which bits were the brushed metal suit. That sort of marriage of the CG and the real, where you're not sure where one ends and one, you know, that's something we always strive for. In one scene, we filmed Robert in a helmet and very little else. Initially, there was a slightly different take on that whole event. Um, Iron Man was going to crash land on the roof and he was going to um, be trying to rewire some stuff on the roof and then Ironmonger was going to land on the roof and, and interrupt him. Now, during the evolution of the film, that changed and Robert actually had thought he'd got rid of Ironmonger, that he's, he's gone now, it's, I've solved the problem. I've got a limp back home on, you know, one RT because the other one's busted up and somehow make it back to, to the Stark campus. And he gets, he gets back to the campus, ends up crash landing on the roof of, of the Tokamak building and says, so, oh, I'm done, take off my helmet, take off my glove. And that was, none of that was in the original performance. It was basically the original performance was him sort of walking forward, talking and then turning around. So the animators had to come in and put a front end on that because we still needed him to open the helmet and it be Robert Downey and it all to match. But the front end, he had to do a quite different performance while he was still Iron Man. I'm almost out of power. I gotta get out of this thing. I'll be right there. We actually went out and took a lot of photographs of all the sets that we were on so that we would have virtual backgrounds. We could recreate the sets in the computer on an as-needed basis. So then we had the option when John wanted us to, to free up the camera. And so we can actually move the camera around to places that it never was in the original footage. So then when we come back to the shot and do our version of it, you know, we're panned a lot more to the right and we've added all this in over here. You know, this is all digital now, but we've mapped on photos that we took of the real set and then put in the sky so that we can really stretch it out and have a much bigger camera move than we had in the original shot. And then the jump is a lot bigger now with a, a more heroic moment in the middle of it. You know, we tried to get what we've been calling a Marvel moment, uh, which is sort of, you know, here where he's, he's really flying through the air. He's got his fist up and he comes down for this big punch. In that case, what, what we did is we recreated the background and then we had the buildings that are just behind, we had the, the city and then uh, the sky and of course the two creatures and that's what gives us 
the final result with a lot of smoke and the effects of um, the repulsor that Jeff will talk about. Uh, some of the various types of elements that went into making like the um, the, the RT effect on like the foot. Um, there were a lot of sort of powerful sort of flamey elements um, that then would get built up. We you know, add sort of glowy cores. We added elements such as this one to sort of uh, that we could animate um, on a shot by shot basis and sort of emphasize different aspects of it, make it feel more powerful at times uh, when he really wanted to goose it and accelerate through the frame. All right, let's see what this thing can do. What's SR-71's record? The altitude record for fixed wing flight is 85,000 feet, sir. Records are made to be broken. Come on! It's been great. It's been really fun. It's a great uh, way to kind of shake things up. I wish I had a suit like that. Good job. Good job.